From the Moan Broadcast Center, I'm Austin Cross. Thanks so much for joining us for a special program. I contain the multitudes. Great American poet Walt Whitman penned that phrase as a literary embrace of all the complexities and paradoxes within us. And if ever there was a person who contained the multitudes, it would be NPR's Ari Shapiro. By day, he's your friendly host of all things considered, asking tough questions, holding people's feet to the fire. But on break... Yeah, he croons tunes with the traveling orchestra Pink Martini. And just when you think that you have got him figured out... You are joie de vivre. You're the top of sometimes. You're a Broadway diva. You're a graceful swan. Your name is on a bar. Stop coming. You are wild and frisky. A Scottish whiskey. A movie star. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, you find him on stage doing a sometimes body cabaret with Tony Award winning actor Alan Cumming. And the best may be yet to come for our drive time companion. It was recently announced that he'll host season seven of The Mole on Netflix. I should also mention he's an author whose debut book became a New York Times bestseller. It's titled The Best Strangers in the World, Stories from a Life Spent Listening. And with such a busy life, I'm a little surprised he actually has time to talk to me. And yet, we got him. Ari Shapiro, thanks so much for making the time. Hi, Austin. That was an amazing introduction. I'm exhausted just listening to it. (laughs) (laughs) Let me ask you this. You've been performing on stage for years after a show with Pink Martini, Alan Cumming. Are people still surprised that you have the pipes to sing a duet or a French song? Yeah. Which is kind of surprising because I've been doing it for a while now. You know, I made my debut with Pink Martini at the Hollywood Bowl in 2008 or 9. I think it was 9. And have sung several times at the Bowl since then. And yet I still, every time I perform in L.A., people come up to me afterwards and say, I didn't know you could sing. And it's always lovely to hear and a compliment. But I kind of wonder, like... It's been 15 years. How many more years do I need to keep doing this? Um, But it's so fun to be able to go from one kind of storytelling to another and, you know, be very kind of like serious and buttoned up on the radio most of the time and then much less serious and much less buttoned up on stage with Pink Martini or with Alan. I mean, it's so funny that you mention that because people do have this perception when you're an NPR journalist that you're kind of like this observer of society. You don't go in for things that are loud or make too much of a statement. With all that, do you ever wrestle with the identities? That's a a perception that definitely still exists, but I think does not reflect the NPR of today. Uh, um, The executive producer of All Things Considered, Sammy Yenigan, often talks about leaning into the all of All Things Considered that Hmm. he wants and I want. And I think the other hosts, too, want our show to reflect life as it is, which is more than just wars and presidential campaigns. It is everything. And so... I love that I get to host a news program that allows me to ask tough questions to people in positions of power and also allows me to go out and tell stories that you would never otherwise hear, that you wouldn't hear anywhere else. And so when I, I mean, to answer your question, when I started singing with Pink Martini, I definitely wrestled with the, is this going to undermine my credibility, self-doubt and fear? But now I love that I get to use these different parts of myself and express myself in different ways and connect with different audiences in a variety of different media, the most recent of which was the book you mentioned, and the next one of which is going to be this reality show on Netflix. Yeah. I mean, somewhere, I think in that book, you mentioned that you see a headset or a microphone as like a snorkel as you get to explore things. Totally. And I just thought that that was such an interesting reference that, yeah, you get so much access. As an NPR host, you get a lot of access. And yet when you're touring the world and you were with Pink Martini in, say, this this country that you mentioned where uh, the person you were performing for, who you did not name, didn't allow people to mm-hmm. obstruct her view yeah. you know, at all. So you're in these different places. 
it was I described it, I think, as one of the Middle East's less autocratic countries or something like that. <laughs> Very diplomatic of you to say it like that. But I mean, it is so interesting because that microphone is kind of that gateway to put you in front of people and to get you sharing what is true or, or what a feeling can actually sound like. Yeah, I think when you use the word access, what comes to mind for a lot of people is being on Air Force One or getting into the room where a presidential debate is happening or behind the scenes of some, I don't know, movie set where a star is doing a great role. And all of that does come with the territory of hosting All Things Considered and getting out into the world and reporting. But to me, what is most valuable about the whole like snorkel and mask part of having a microphone and a headset is that I can go into people's homes in communities that mm. if I were a tourist, I would not have access to people's lives in the same way that I do as a journalist. So I think about like, you know, a, a little over a year ago, I did a reporting project that took me from Senegal to Morocco to Spain, connecting the dots from climate change to global migration to political extremism, trying to wow. tackle these three huge global trends in a, a human way and tell compelling stories about people whose lives reflected the interconnectedness of these three big things. And I just felt so grateful that in Senegal, in Morocco, in Spain, we were able to go deep into people's lives, whether it was you know, immigrants in Spain working as strawberry pickers without documentation right. or fishermen in Senegal who were not able to catch the fish that their fathers and grandfathers used to fish because of climate change. Those kinds of stories are things that I have access to by virtue of being a journalist that I just don't think I would ever be able to touch on otherwise. And then the great thing is that I get to share it with an audience of listeners who hopefully find it as compelling as I do. You know, I have to say, because I am the local host of All Things Considered here, so I remember that series. and I just remember um, how much compassion and sensitivity that you had as you told that story. And I really felt very fully immersed in it. So I want to say that. Thank you. And use that as a way to leap to some of your other coverage when you were the London correspondent and you went out and you were uh, following a Syrian refugee mm -hmm. uh, as he tried to make his way to Germany. And I think about just how much, again, we're going to use that access, how much access you get to people on a one-on-one -on -one level, people that most Americans, if, if we're going to be frank, most of us are not going to get a lot of um, proximity to those people quite the same way that you are. I'm wondering, has it changed you when you get to be so close to people who are going through such an upending moment in their lives? Right now in the world we live in, there are so many really strong forces that encourage us to isolate ourselves in bubbles where people agree with us and think the same way that we do. And, you know, those forces include everything from social media algorithms to political parties the great thing that I think journalism can do, the great thing that I think listening can do, and and specifically public radio can do, is help people build their empathy muscles, mm. help people see the world through the eyes of somebody very different from them. I think, you know, hopefully if you listen to All Things Considered, you will hear perspectives that are not your own. You will hear ideas that you disagree with. But more than anything else, I want listeners to be able to see the world through the eyes of somebody whose life seems so very different from theirs. And that doesn't just mean a Syrian refugee who I met on a sidewalk in Turkey and then followed all the way through Europe. Mm. It could also mean, you know, I, I'm thinking about when the longest government shutdown in U.S. history happened. A producer team and I went to this small town in the middle of Louisiana, which we, in a very unscientific way, determined was the town that was arguably most affected by the government shutdown because the biggest employers were federal prison and immigration detention center. Mm. And so we talked to these people who had been working and going without paychecks for weeks. And I didn't ask them about their political leanings, but they were very vulnerable and honest about the challenges that they were experiencing and the, the suffering that was hitting their community because of the government shutdown. And the outpouring of reaction from listeners who, I don't ask the listeners political leanings, but it wasn't about where do these people stand on 
gun rights. Who did these people vote for for president? It was about here's a parent who can't get a birthday present for their child mm. and listeners saying, I want to go on Amazon and get a birthday present for this kid. How can I do it? And that kind of empathy and seeing the world through the eyes of someone who's different from you, I think, is one of the best things that public radio specifically and journalism generally can do for us in this moment. I'm Austin Cross, and I'm talking with Ari Shapiro, host of All Things Considered. When we come back... Everybody in my school had an opinion about gay people in the abstract, but most of them had never knowingly met one. And so suddenly these kind of amorphous, free-floating ideas that people had could all be projected onto me. Growing up and coming out. That's ahead. I'm Austin Cross. Thanks so much for joining us for our special program here on LAS 89.3. My guest today is one of the co-hosts of All Things Considered, Ari Shapiro. Ari, I want to go back a little bit to younger Ari, the one that was born in Fargo, North Dakota. Mm -hmm. Your family was one of the few Jewish families there. Yeah. And there's this story that you tell in your book um, that, about what you and your brother would do. And it sounded to me like, you know, you got very comfortable being you out loud very early on in your life. Can you just tell us a little bit about what you would do? That's a great way of phrasing it. Yes. My brother, who's three years older than me, Dan, I, I'm the middle of three boys um, and we're all three years apart. So my brother, Dan, and I were two of the very few, if not the only Jewish kids in our public elementary school in Fargo, North Dakota in the 80s. And so every December, we would go from classroom to classroom with a menorah and a dreidel telling kids what Hanukkah was. <laughs> and, you know, most of these kids had not necessarily heard of Jews or Judaism. They certainly hadn't heard of Hanukkah. And so, as I say in the book, like, I became a public speaker in the first grade, standing in front of a classroom with a menorah and a dreidel, explaining my family's traditions. And I realize in hindsight, that might feel sort of isolating and othering, but I don't think it felt that way to me. I think the way I felt about it was I have something special that I can share with somebody else. And I now realize that what I was just saying about building empathy and seeing the world through the eyes of somebody who's different from you is kind of what I was doing in the first grade with the menorah and the dreidel. Like, yes, my religion might be different from your religion, but isn't this interesting and something that you can dig into and learn about and see the world in greater nuance because of it? Sounds like even that long ago, little Ari liked the connection with people. Yeah. I mean, I think I've always been an extrovert. I have, if I'm being honest, never shied away from the limelight. <laughs> and also, <laughs> I yeah, I have always enjoyed connecting with people in whatever form that might take. Um, my grandmother, actually, Grandma Sylvia, my mother's mother, was a fortune teller. She... I don't know how else to say it. She would wear a blonde wig and false eyelashes, and she would read people's cards or palms or coffee grounds or tea leaves at carnivals and fairs. Wow. And I, and I think that that was actually kind of a different version of what I also do, which is listening really closely to people, trying to connect with people, trying to tease out something that might not be immediately evident. Mm. And without weighing in on the validity of psychic powers or lack thereof, <laughs> I do think that kind of what I do is a different version of what she did. And so in a way, I'm kind of carrying on that family tradition. Oh, I just love that so much. Um, well, to keep with that, the ability to, you know, be yourself, no matter what the extrovert part of you, that faced a new challenge when your family later moved to Oregon. Uh, then a lot happened in a few years after you came to Oregon, both in terms of state policy, which factors into this, our, our, our potential state policy, and you and your identity. Can you tell us about that transition? So you went from being the kid who was in the class teaching about your background um, to now being a high schooler in a state that was considering some legislation that I mean, really cast people, especially people close to you, in a dark light. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So in Oregon in the 90s, there were a couple of ballot measures that would have more or less made it illegal to be gay. Like you could fire public school teachers for being gay. It would have required that schools teach that 
homosexuality is, um, I don't have the wording in front of me, but basically comparable to all kinds of other horrible things from, I don't know, fill in the blank, pedophilia, pedophilia bestiality, and whatever. And, um, yeah. and so those debates were happening when I was kind of like in middle school. And then when I was in high school, I came out of the closet at the age of 16. And I was at this big, uh, mostly white suburban public school that um, did not, to my knowledge, ever have an out gay kid among the student body before. And suddenly I was very out. And I just figured like, there's no point in trying to deal with a whisper campaign. Let's just pull out the bullhorn. Hmm. And so I put a pink triangle pin on my backpack, which was kind of the go-to gay pride symbol before the rainbow flag became the de facto gay pride symbol. I put a pink triangle pin on my back. It has like a Nazi connection. Yeah, yeah. Um, in World War II, the Nazis made gay people wear a pink triangle as a sign of their homosexuality. And so it was adopted as a gay pride symbol later. Um, so anyway, I put a pink triangle pin on my backpack. I plastered my locker at my senior year of high school with postcards of hunky men. I really <laughs> sort of leaned into the whole thing. And again, it was this scenario where because of those ballot measures that everybody in Oregon had been screaming about at the top of their lungs, everybody in my school had an opinion about gay people in the abstract, but most of them had never knowingly met one. And so suddenly these kind of amorphous free-floating ideas that people had could all be projected onto me for better or for worse. Mm. And it was, it, I mean... Compared to a lot of teenage coming out stories, mine was much more pleasant than lots that I've heard. But it was also kind of a trial by fire. And I sort of became, I don't know, a symbol in my senior year for a lot of things that a lot of people had strong feelings about. And I found myself in the middle of that. What I also found was that Portland in the 90s had this thriving underground queer teenage scene. Mm. And so I suddenly was plunged into this world of instantaneous friendships with people who were very different from me because I had this middle-class suburban life with two parents who were married and had good jobs. And suddenly my friends were teenagers who did not have that kind of stability at all. You know, maybe they were unhoused. Maybe they were struggling with addiction. Maybe they were doing sex work, whatever it was we were all part of this little club, this posse, and we looked out for each other and we stood up for each other. And that expanded my horizons in a really dramatic way in the same way that I think just my being out at school expanded the horizons of my classmates. I mean, how important was it just to have that community at that time when everybody around you was still trying to figure out what it meant to even know a gay person. Oh, it was huge. And I sometimes think about if my parents had stayed in Fargo, oh. what coming out of the age of 16 in Fargo would have meant in contrast to Portland, I think it would have been a very different experience. I mean, so as I hear all of this, what comes to me again, you say you're an extrovert and you've always been comfortable uh, being you out loud. And at that time, you know, some people might have been tempted to see the challenges that they would face if they were to come out as gay. They might have found it easier, at least in the short term, to hide who they were, uh, especially if they didn't feel safe. That never really seems like it was an option that you considered. It seemed like if you were going to live this life, you were going to be you. Well, I realize this is a great luxury that I had as a teenager is that I did feel safe. There was never a question in my mind about my parents that they would kick me out of the house or reject me. And, and for many queer young people, that is a real question and that is a real threat. And that is a very compelling reason not to come out of the closet. And so I would never tell anyone you have to come out regardless of the circumstances. For me, I started to think about, well, it's never going to be pleasant and easy to come out. That's just the nature of it. But the sooner I do this, the sooner I can just get on with my life and, I definitely did not want to live a double life or keep secrets, but I also didn't want to kind of stay stagnant in this purgatory. Yeah. Um, and so I just thought, rip off the Band-Aid and move on. You had a coming out conversation with your brother. How did that go? So I was going to be a senior in high school when my younger brother was going to be a freshman. And the summer, I sort of came out at the end of my junior year, and then I had this great summer. And then I said to my younger brother, look, you're starting high school. I am probably going to get a lot of flack for being the one out gay kid in school. 
and you as my younger brother might get some of that blowback as well. And I'm sorry you didn't sign up for this and you don't deserve it, but I just, you know, want to apologize and give you a heads up that this might be coming your way. And he said, well, you didn't sign up for that either and you don't deserve it either. And I thought, wow, this kid's pretty sophisticated for a 13-year-old. Wow. Are you and your brother close? Uh, yeah. I mean, my whole family is close. My parents are both still living in Portland and still alive and healthy. And my older brother in Seattle has a wife and two kids. My younger brother in Berkeley has a wife and two kids. Um, and I feel very lucky to have a family that I, that I actually enjoy talking to and spending time with. I love to hear that. I'm Austin Cross. I'm talking right now with Ari Shapiro, one of the hosts of All Things Considered on NPR. Ari, a lot of people might not know that after college, you became an intern for NPR legal affairs correspondent Nina Totenberg. Mm -hmm. But getting there was a bit of a challenge. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, I had never done any journalism in high school or college. I had actually never even taken a journalism course. When I was finishing college, I graduated from Yale with an English major, and I cast a very wide net applying for everything I could think of, including an internship at NPR. And I got rejected for literally everything, including an internship at NPR. Ooh. And um, to me, this is a lesson that you just keep trying. And failure is a stop on the path to success. Failure is not the opposite of success. So after I got rejected for literally everything, I went back to being a summer camp counselor because that was the only thing I knew to do next. And while I was there, I learned that Nina Totenberg hires her own interns separate from the NPR internship program. So I applied to Nina. She gave me an opportunity. That was my foot in the door, and I've never left. And Nina remains a great friend and mentor who I adore, and her office is just around the corner from my office, and we talk all the time, and I feel very, very lucky to have her in my corner. I'm kind of curious. What was your pitch to her? Gosh, it was so long ago. I, You know, I think I don't know if this was the actual pitch, but this is the pitch if I were doing it today, what I would say, and for all I know, it's what I said 25 years ago, okay. is that being a liberal arts English major, but it could be history or philosophy or political science or anything, teaches you three skills that are really important for journalism, which is how to read, write, and think. And what I mean is you take a complicated text or a document, you read it, and you figure out, this is the thinking part, what is important, what is essential. And then you write that in a way that can be understood. Mm. So maybe in college, I was reading Toni Morrison or William Shakespeare, and I was writing and thinking about that. But it could just as easily be a Supreme Court opinion or draft legislation. And the skills that I gained as an English major, reading, writing, and thinking, are skills that I use every day as a journalist. That's a good pitch, Ari. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say I'd say yes to that too. That's pretty good. I feel like everybody who's listening would say, "Yeah, that's pretty good." Don't let anyone tell you that an English major is worthless or any liberal arts major for that matter. I'm Austin Cross and I'm talking to NPR's Ari Shapiro. Coming up, what right do I have with all of the opportunities that I've been given to just throw up my hands in despair and say it's too hard? It would be insulting to those people who I find so inspiring if I were to just sort of leave it in their hands and say, I can't. It's not my problem. It's not something that I can face or deal with. Sometimes you got to be the change you want to see. That's ahead. I'm Austin Cross. Thanks so much for joining us for this special show here on LAS 89.3. My guest today is Ari Shapiro, host of All Things Considered. He's an award-winning journalist who's traveled the world to bring us stories from places that few of us will ever go. So in the final part of our conversation, I asked him, what makes a great story? There are several components, and I can list a few of them. Great characters, surprise, questions that you want the answer to. You know, I sometimes tell people who are early in their career as a reporter that if they go out to report a story and come back with exactly what they expected, they're doing it wrong. Mm. Or at least it's not going to be great. Like, finding the thing that makes you think, oh, uh, that is not what I'll, I'll give you an example from a reporting trip that I did in February to West Virginia with the intention of reporting on wind energy jobs that were taking the place of coal jobs. And I set out to do that story and learned so many things that were not what I expected that to my mind made the story more interesting. For example, coal requires so many more people working in the coal mines than wind turbines. And so hmm. you can replace coal energy with wind energy, 
but you're not necessarily going to replace cold jobs with wind jobs because there are far fewer jobs to produce the same amount of wind. Another thing I discovered was that the narrative of renewable energy jobs replacing fossil fuel jobs is completely false because if you look at fossil fuel and specifically coal jobs in the United States, they went over a cliff decades ago because of many different things from automation to you can list all of them over the decades. But at the point that clean energy really started ramping up, coal jobs were already a teeny tiny fraction of what they had been. And so that's the kind of I mean, that's very technical, but when I talk about things that are unexpected and things that are surprising, that's one key component. Another one, of course, is people who you want to listen to, people whose stories you want to follow and are curious about, um, you know, details that bring things to life, writing in a visual way. I could go on and on. I mean, I, I love especially just the value of going there and actually finding out what the story is, letting the story tell you essentially how to tell it. Mm -hmm. And as I think about those sorts of communities, though, where there might be coal jobs, my mind immediately just goes to places where they don't have a lot of, say, robust local news coverage and how details like that, if you know somebody like you isn't coming in to, to help amplify uh, somebody's experience, how those stories might not get told. I think broadly speaking, what you're saying is true, and I will get to your point in a moment, but I do want to say that in West Virginia, there is incredible local news coverage, and we really relied on those reporters in doing our research, mm. and it includes public radio, but it's not only public radio, so I, I do want to acknowledge those local news reporters, Sure, yeah. but I am also very aware that in many states in this country, the newspaper that used to publish big investigative pieces is no longer even publishing seven days a week, and in many places... The only full-time reporter covering the governor's mansion or the mayor's office is a public radio reporter. And that's why public radio stations are so vital to the future of democracy. Let me go here. In your book, you talk about how you were working on 9-11 and you were calling shops near the World Trade Center. Uh, that day you got a pep talk from one of the hosts essentially saying that, you know, people want to know what they can do to help we at least know what we can do to help. This is an election year. Bring it a full circle now. This is an election year. There are folks who are definitely concerned about what could happen, about the future even of democracy. What is your role personally as you see it right now? Well, I think we have a number of roles. I mean, one is to help keep people informed. So answering basic questions like, if Joe Biden gets a second term as president, what would he do in those four years? If Donald Trump gets a second term as president, what would he do in those four years? That kind of providing information is one really important, valuable function that we serve. And another one is hearing what's important to people. Like, what do Americans want from their government right now? I think that's a really important question that we can help answer by going out and talking to people. And that's a slightly different function from saying... Well, people perceive the economy this way, but the reality is the economy is that way. You know, I did a story recently about there's this widespread perception that crime is going up in the country and actually the numbers are quite striking in that crime is going down. Mm. And so that kind of a fact checky report what's actually happening is one important role we can play. But another one is really listening to people and sharing with our audience what it is that we're hearing. I mean, with so much happening in the world, and obviously, as you've now pointed out, the way that people perceive things, it's not always the case when you dig into, say, the numbers, the actual data behind it. But yet there are people who are feeling uh, extremely discouraged right now. I, I mentioned fear earlier. A lot of concerns on a number of fronts. Um, where do you personally find hope? Well, I have a number of answers to that question. And in some ways, I think my book is one long answer to that question is like, how do you stay optimistic in the face of so many bleak things? Right. Um, a lot of the people I interviewed give me hope. And just recently, I spoke to a fiction author whose book, The Future, is kind of about the apocalypse. Her name is Naomi Alderman. She's British. Like me, she was raised in a Jewish family. And when I asked her about kind of, the, you know, the sense of doom that hangs over so much, she quoted... Uh, the Talmud to me, this line that says, it is not your responsibility to complete the work, but neither are you free to refrain from it, which is to say, 
We don't have to worry about someday far in the future when all of our problems are solved. We just have to do one thing that helps. Mm. Pick up a bit of trash in your neighborhood, whatever it is. If perfection were the point, we would not have been made so very imperfect. So just do one small thing and then another small thing and then another small thing. So that's one answer to the question of where do I find hope. Yeah. The other answer is that I have interviewed so many people who have so much less power and privilege than I do. And nevertheless, they insist on using whatever space that is that they occupy to make the world better for those around them. I think to myself, if they can do that with whatever small circle they occupy, then what right do I have with all of the opportunities that I've been given to just throw up my hands in despair and say it's too hard? It would be insulting to those people who I find so inspiring if I were to just sort of leave it in their hands and say, I can't, it's not my problem, it's not something that I can face or deal with. I'm Austin Cross. I'm talking right now with NPR's Ari Shapiro, one of the hosts of All Things Considered. Thank you so much for sharing that, Ari. I, I think I get a lot from that personally, just hearing your take on it. I hope it's helpful. I mean, I feel very lucky to be able to ask these kinds of questions to people who think about them a lot. And so I feel like the least I can do is then share the answers that I hear with anyone else who wants to know. Before I let you go, I do want to ask you about Something new that's happening in your life very soon. You will soon be the host of The Mole on Netflix. How did that happen? It's a show that I have been a fan of for, like, since its existence. You know, in the early 2000s, in the very earliest days of reality TV competitions, um, the show started on ABC and Anderson Cooper was the host. It's always been hosted by a journalist. Then a couple years ago, Netflix rebooted it. And my good friend Alex Wagner from MSNBC was the host for the Netflix reboot. But then she got Rachel Maddow's old job. And so ah. Netflix went looking for another host. And I, not knowing they were looking for a host, randomly said at some point to my agent, I would love to host a show like The Mole. And they said, well, actually, The Mole is looking for a new host right now. And literally two months later, I was on a plane to Malaysia. <laughs> and so we filmed 10 episodes in July and August of 2023. And I have sat on the secret for a year. And now the show is finally going to be out on Netflix. And uh, it's weird because I have the luxury of having a certain kind of, I'm using air quotes, fame where the people who know who I am don't necessarily know what I look like. <laughs> and I like that because if I fall asleep on an airplane and drool on my hoodie, nobody will say, I saw Ari Shapiro drooling on his hoodie on an airplane asleep. Mm. I don't know whether being on the mole will change that, but I'm about to find out. One radio person to another, do people always say, oh, I didn't know you look like that? Oh, yeah. In fact, when I give a speech, um, the first words out of my mouth are always, you all look nothing like what I imagined either. <laughs> How do you think young Ari, who used to teach kids in Fargo about Judaism, would feel about all this now? Oh, I think he would be as excited as I am. I, it's really, I don't take for granted the fact that I'm able to do these things that are so fun and also soul-filling and also like aligned with my values of telling stories and connecting with people and building empathy and so the fact that somehow this kind of jigsaw puzzle of different things that allow me to pursue those values in so many varied ways has somehow magically assembled is something that I just feel very, very lucky to be in the middle of. Um, I think that eight-year-old Ari would be excited to dive in. That's Ari Shapiro, one of the hosts of All Things Considered on NPR. Ari, thank you so much for making the time. Thanks, Austin. It's been really fun. And thank you for listening. If you missed any of my conversation today with Ari Shapiro, you can find it again on YouTube. Just search LAist, L-A-I-S-T, and there we will be. 